Mother Claire, where are we sitting at the moment? So we're in Our Lady Queen of Angels convent and this is our chapel. Tell me about the work of the sisters here in Harlem. First of all, our work is prayer because we're contemplatives in action. So we do um, take our prayer life very, very seriously. Uh, praying, of course, the Divine Office, the Holy Mass every day, Eucharistic Adoration, and that is central to our life. But our, but our work is hands-on work with the very poor, and that's why we live here in Harlem, and we choose to live in places like the Bronx, uh, where we began in the South Bronx, and um, places noted for their poverty and, and need. So hands-on work with the very poor, living among the poor, being with the poor, and serving our neighbors. Uh, and then evangelization is the other piece. So. Um, spreading the gospel, direct evangelization of the poor and anybody else because we're all spiritually poor. So it's those two hands on work with the, with the poor and then evangelization. When you look around here in Harlem, what is the greatest need you see? There's so many needs. There are so many needs. And, um, you know, the, the needs of the human being are the same anywhere, anywhere you go. And, and the need is for love, the need is for um, belonging, uh, the need is for um, God. You know? And so here, here is a place noted, noted for its poverty, I would say, but it's poverty, it's not just a material poverty. Um, there's a poverty of family, family structure, of, of order, of, um, uh, so there's a lot of layers to the, to the poverty here. And uh, when so, you say poverty of families, uh, mother, you mean broken families, Absolutely. absent parents. Correct. Yeah, children being raised by their grandparents, um, certainly broken families, the absence of fathers. Um, yeah, so the, so the, the broken family, the, the children that don't know uh, one or maybe both of their parents in some cases. What effect does that have on children, have you seen? It's totally destabilizing for children, totally destabilizing. And uh, yeah, that's your first experience of God. It's your first experience of um, security, of, um, of peace. And when that's not there from the very beginning, your, your whole footing uh, from the very beginning is uh, unsteady and un unstable. And you see that around you here a oh, lot. Oh, absolutely. When I, in fact, even before I entered, which is over 20 years ago now, and I was just visiting and, and visiting in the Bronx, and we were um, working at a, at a soup kitchen, so returning to the convent very late. It was, it was past 11, and, uh, and, and I saw on the street there as we were opening the gate to um, you know, a mother with her, her infant child and her toddler child as if it were the middle of the day. And this is just a very common thing, and no sense of, of structure or order or, and, and it's no criticism of the poor mother, she's probably doing something she needed to do, but the, the, the sense of there's no rhythm to a normal life that you would have in, in, a, in a traditional family. Um, young, young children going into the gang lifestyle. Um, like how young would they be? I think, you know, 12 and 14, you know, 12, 13 and 14, I think young kids of that age are very often, um, at least that's what we're, we get a sense of. And they see it as a glamorous life. Yeah, and I think belonging to something also, you know, it's just belonging to something and, um, and I think it's that, that search for family. They may not have a father figure in their life, but the head of the gang will act like that father figure and take them under their wing. Exactly, and, and, and also in a place like this too, sometimes there can be a listlessness and what else is there to belong to and to join? There can be a sort of a depression over the place sometimes in a, in a very poor, poor area. There's also bright spots and there are, you know, there are people of deep, deep generational faith and real, uh, those grandmothers who are saving the world, they are the saints next door, as Pope Francis talks about, who are raising those children and bringing them to church and instilling faith in them. And there are heroes too. It, it's not just um, the darkness, there's always the light as well. So the work of the sisters here is trying to alleviate some of the suffering and by, through what means? Mm -hmm. Oh, many different means. So our first thing is to just establish ourselves in a community um, to become neighbors of the people who are there and just the availability, the simple availability that you can ring the doorbell and we're here. And so the needs are going to be extremely varied for, for the people. So, so first the availability and then sometimes it really is uh, food support or clothing support, um, emotional support. Um, a spiritual support. So whatever, you know, very individually, whoever's at our door, what are the needs of, of that person? So for the homeless, we try to be available to the homeless and that set of needs is one 
thing, and then there might be a family situation where they're maybe um, struggling undocumented uh, new immigrants, and so their set of needs are gonna be entirely different. Uh, so we just try to be available and meet the people right where they are and see what we can do, how can we, and how can the church assist them, and be, be available to them. But also someone to listen to them and see them and look them in the eye is the much deeper need, you know, that, that really we all experience, the need to be seen um, and to be cared for, uh, to be loved. A lot of crime in the area as well, and gangs. It, it does cross our paths. I mean, we are nestled here right in the midst of projects um, that do, d there is a gang problem, you know, right here in, in our neighborhood. And it is not uncommon to hear the sound of gunshots, you know, uh, right here for you sure. Hear the, you hear the sound of gunshots sometimes. Oh, yeah, not infrequently, not, not infrequently at all. Um, it's just part and parcel to living where we do. So we do see, we do see that kind of crime uh, on a very regular basis. Um, and we're trying to be an influence for the good and the wholesome. And, and just to, again, that availability to the people um, and, and being present does change the climate of an area. And so we're just trying little by little by opening the doors of the church, opening the doors of our convent, um, making it a place where it's safe um, and it's good and it's wholesome and trying to increase the beauty of the neighborhood and the, the, just the goodness by what's available. Do the people here have a sense of God or faith? People do have a sense of God. They do, and they do have a sense of faith. And, and it's very, very interesting to experience. Even as I travel in other parts of the world, you know, um, people here uh, do, they see us and they know that we represent God somehow. And that is not, that has not been lost. And these could be completely unchurched people, but there is, a, there is an identification um, with the religious habit and, and who we are and God. And we see that time and time again, even with the young whom you may, uh, you know, we may be quick to write off the younger generation sometimes, but there is still, somehow there's, Christianity isn't totally evaporated from America yet. Do they respect you when you're walking around the neighborhood? Yes, yes, they do, you know, and, and because of that, we don't feel unsafe, even though we're in very unsafe places. You don't feel unsafe? We don't feel unsafe because for the most part, people, even, even the most, you know, hoodlum among them, will generally respect the fact that, that we're religious sisters and, and there's an understanding that we somehow are connected to God. How dangerous is the neighborhood? Because even last night when I was going to the hotel, which is very close to here, the Uber, there was some mistake with the system and it brought me a few streets close by but the driver would not let me out. He said, no, 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 I'll drive you straight to the door of your hotel. You don't want to get out here in this neighborhood. Yeah, it's I was saying, I'll just get out and I'll walk the few blocks. He so knew better. 11 o'clock at night, he said, no, <laughs> he buddy, knew. you won't. Yeah, you'd have to borrow one of these if you were gonna do that, I think. You'd have to borrow one of these from us. It's that dangerous It sometimes. is, it is, you know, and it's not an exaggeration at all. And um, no, we, it is that dangerous. And just, just the other week we had, I think, was it four shootings in a row just in this, in this three street, uh, area. Is it difficult for you when you put all of your time and effort and prayers into trying to improve the situation and you know on the surface you look around and it doesn't seem to be getting any better even 10 years in? You know it, it is not discouraging because we see little victories. We see little victories all the time and, and, and one of them is you know this this church here is a parish church in the, in the archdiocese and it was closed so many places are experiencing closures for good reason, uh, but it, it was closed and we um, have the blessing and the permission to reopen the doors, not as a parish, but as a place of prayer, you know, as a place of prayer for the poor and, and for, for the neighborhood. And that was one year ago, um, this August 22nd, the Queenship of Mary. And uh, the, to see the people streaming into the church for adoration, uh, for one, Thing. That, that builds so much hope, you know, so much hope. The other night, um, just a couple of weeks ago, we did a, a similar to a night fever event, we call it Light the Fire, where we have Eucharistic adoration, and we just open the doors of the church, and the sisters go out and just make a simple invitation. Would you like to come in and light a candle? Would you like to come in and spend a moment of prayer? Now, confessions are going on, and music is happening, so cer certainly more could happen than the lighting of the candle, but just a, at minimum, a chance to come in, uh, enter the church, light a candle. We were stunned by the out, outcome of, of that night. Almost no one refused us, whether they were, you know, young teenage boys in, in a gang or whether they were 
you know, older people, and everyone in between, everyone in between. And it just is, would you like to just come in and, and, and light a candle? So even the gang members, you're stopping Absolutely. them and saying. Absolutely. We just do want to say a prayer, you know, and, and this sense of, yeah, like, I need God. And, you know, if someone's in a gang, they're, they're looking to belong. Everyone's looking for God. You know, everyone's looking for love. Everyone's looking for what they're ultimately created for. And so, uh, yeah, so the response was tremendous and we were overjoyed and we'll be doing that sort of thing. So that, that's why we don't get discouraged because we see that, that you know, there are little victories and the Lord um, just reaches out and touches one heart at a time, one person at a time, and, and we're satisfied with that. We can, we can take the long, slow approach. You are from Ohio? Ohio, yes that you were a military kid, so kind of from a bit all over. That's right, that's right. And growing up in Ohio, what kind of things were you interested in or what sparked your enthusiasm as a kid? I grew up moving around, you know, with my father in the military, and so we traveled to quite a bit. And um, I was just into the outdoors, just playing outside. I, I would have been content to be outside from the time the sun went, you know, rose to, to when it set. I, for me, being just being outside um, in the woods or, you know, that, that, was what, that was what my greatest love as a child. But as a, let's say, teenager or a young person, if I was to say to you, in years to come, you'll be sitting in a convent in Harlem in New York City. Could have never dreamed of that. No? Could have never dreamed of that. No, no, certainly not. What would you have said to me teenager. back then? I would have said, what, what are you on? <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I really, it was, it was not in my consciousness at all. And even though I was raised in a, in a Catholic family, both of my parents are being very devout. Uh, they're also both converts, and uh, so they, weren't, they didn't have a Catholic education growing up, and then being raised on military bases exclusively, so in, in military schools exclusively, Department of Defense, dependent schools. So I didn't see a religious, I never saw anyone dressed in garb like this, never went to, I didn't even know Catholic schools existed, which is the place where most people are exposed to the possibility of a religious life or to a vocation. And uh, so it was really far from my consciousness. And uh, was, I did, however, uh, develop a relationship with God from a young age. You know, from, from really the eighth grade, I started to pray and took my faith seriously and wanted to give myself to God in a radical way. But I did not equate that desire to this, to the consecrated life. I just didn't have a reference point for this at all. So I thought, oh, I'll be a missionary in Africa or something, because that's kind of like the quintessential way to give your life, in, in, at least in my imagination. I'll be a missionary in Africa. And that way you can also be married and have children and do something radical for Jesus, and it all kind of coalesces. So was, that, was that your dream, to uh, have a family, to get married? Yes, oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, really. That was absolutely my dream. And I did not have a sense, though, of a call that God really has a will and a desire for each person. That, that escaped me somehow until my college years. It just dawned on me. I'm sure, I'm sure I learned that along the way, but I was just not um, reflecting on the fact that there's, there's a call upon a life. So I was going about my life like many young people do, trying to figure out what I was passionate about and what I really desired and wanted. And, and what were you studying in college? So, well, I had a variety of things I studied in college, but biology, uh, first of all, and then theology, but then I added on history, and then I went into catechetics as things evolved through the college years. Wow. So nice broad spectrum. A there. nice broad spectrum, yes, which is the result of not knowing yourself very well. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so. Biology, no theology, no catechism. Exactly. <laughs> confusion, yeah. confusion, and, and, and discernment can be a confusion. So, yeah. But then at what point did it start to creep into your mind, um, maybe it will be the religious life for me, not the married family life? Well, that was, that was a huge struggle to come to that point. That did not come easily. And I really put up a, a real great fight. And, um, and so the way it evolved for me was first the slow dawning of the realization that God does place a call upon a life. And it'd be a wise thing to seek his will. And that took me a little time to, to recognize that basic truth. Then once I did, some terror set in because the thought his will could be very different than what I've been imagining for myself for a very long time. And if these two things don't match up, where does that leave me? And so finally what happened just to, to advance the story a bit here, I did graduate. I was really in a, in a wrestling match with the Lord about the question of vocation and felt I was getting nowhere. And I was getting nowhere. So that was an accurate sense of things. Were you engaged or in a relationship or something? I just ended a relationship. And, and in part, you know, as I was going through this, this struggle here about my vocation, 
Then right after graduating, I did a cross-country walk for life. And, and so for me, walking across the country and having time to think and pray and process helped me uh, to really get in touch with, with what God might be asking of me and, and really to surrender. And, um, but really, I think the crux of it was turning to Our Lady. And when I turned to Our Lady, and, and in, in some little moment of humility to say, I really, I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't know how to, to go forward in my life. I don't know how to discern. People talk about discerning. I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. And in a real moment of, um, of humbly uh, reaching out for help, from, from our Blessed Mother, and, and I really, and I asked her at that point, just, just carry me to the will of the Father. And it all happened very quickly, um, that at a, at a Mass, at the elevation of the Blessed Sacrament, I knew that the Lord was calling me to Himself. I made the phone call to this convent, I came here, I entered, and it was over. I mean, the sermon over, and that was 20-some uh, years ago now. Hey, how do you feel today? I have never been so happy, and I thank God that He's been so patient with me. And I think back on those years of struggle, and I think, what a fool I was to resist him. What a fool I was. God is good. He's good. He's only good. He's always good, and his plan is good. But to re and we know that. You know, we know that in our minds, but to believe it in our hearts and then live from that place is an entirely different thing. So I was a fool, and this is a gift, and I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Really, you have that sense that this is your vocation. You would not like to be doing anything else in the world. Oh okay, yeah, there's no question. God's will is all there is. That's where happiness is, that's where peace is, that's where satisfaction is. And yeah, for me, there's nothing else. For me, there's nothing else. The world has nothing to offer. The, your hopes and dreams for the future, for yourself and for the sisters here in Harlem. Yes. I hope and pray that we will remain faithful to God. You know, that's all, that's all that matters is, is remaining in the will of God, no matter what it looks like exteriorly. Simple, um, hidden, serving um, the maternal face of the church in very, very difficult places. And if we can do that, um, th that, that will be enough. Is it difficult for you and for the other sisters today when you look around at the declining numbers of young women coming in and taking up a, a life of sisterhood and vocation? It is, it is, it is at times, for sure, you know, and uh, especially because, because I know the sweetness from the inside. I know the struggle, um, I, I know the thought pattern, I know the resistance from my own personal resistance, but I also know the sweetness and the joy. And I know what um, women are missing who are being called and who haven't been able to make that leap yet. So there's, you know, but, it, but God knows, you know, so we pray and we live and, and he'll work out the rest.